All right, I'm back. Changed my shirt. So, we are going to look at the three major types of shock that uh, this chapter covers. These were most shock will fall into these categories. So we have cardiogenic, distributive, and hypovolemic. Occasionally, you'll see another category called obstructive. Um, that get often gets lumped in with either cardiogenic or distributive based on the cause. So, um, cardiogenic, anytime there's a problem with the heart, anytime the pump is the failure of the system, neuro, um, distributive is anytime there's a problem with the vessels themselves. So you have an enlarged vessel, you know, the vessels are dilating out, whether that's through sepsis infection or through a um, neurogenic dilation due to lack of sympathetic tone or even anaphylaxis due to an increased release of histamines. So these are all some of the various causes of distributive shock. And then obviously hypovolemic, I think, should go without saying it's low blood volume. But it isn't always hemophragic. It's not always the result of bleeding. It can be the direct result of a fluid shifts due to another disease process or nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Oh, well, obviously the nausea doesn't make you dehydrated, but the vomiting and the diarrhea, sweat, exertion, things like that. So um, notice how it's talking here about obstructive shock, other conditions that lead to it. This would be, uh, though it's not really a category here per se, uh, like I mentioned, it's often connected to either cardiac or distributive. Obstructive shock is when you have a blockage in the blood vessels, as it indicates. So this could be a pulmonary embolism blocking a large portion of the blood flow through your pulmonary circulation. It could be a pneumothorax that's increasing interthoracic pressure, resulting in a compression on the aortas, or possibly even and actually more likely the vena cava that's preventing a return, preventing a preload of blood from coming back to the lung, or to the heart. Or it could be a pericardial tamponade, which is fluid built up inside the pericardium that's compressing the myocardium and preventing it from expanding and therefore preventing it from filling, which means it can't pump out, kind of the same way that you die when you are buried in sand or some loose um, dry good like that. All right, so what are we doing for shock? Well, this should be clear. Shock is one of the conditions, though, that we will administer oxygen. In most other disease processes, stroke, um, heart attack, and things like that, we're going to reserve oxygen for the patient. On the we're going to hold oxygen until the patient is showing a SAT less than 94, 94 percent or less. This is because the lack of uh, or the damage caused by the hypoxia with the stroke or the MI are going to result in the release of free radicals and oxygen in high concentrations can actually uh, promote the uh, production of free radicals. So we would like to withhold the oxygen and target between 95 and 99%. Well, when we're dealing with shock, the patient has a lack of perfusion. There's a decreased amount of red blood cells that carrying capacity is the problem. We will infuse as much oxygen into their blood as we can to raise that pul the um, partial pressure of O2 in their arterial blood. It's called the PaO2. And that way we can make sure that they're getting the best perfusion possible to their tissue. So also obviously comfort, um, maintain body heat. So we're going to have to keep them warm. It is imperative that we remember that the first thing a patient loses in shock is the ability to generate heat. When they cannot produce ATP at the cells, they can't break ATP. And when ATP is not being used and being broken, you know, separated from into ADP and inorganic phosphate, then heat is heat is being released when that happens. When that can't happen, when you can't um, synthesize ATP and then uh, split it again using it, um, blanking on the actual word that we're supposed to use to, for that term. Um, I guess it's a uh, catabolite, it's a catabolism of sorts, but anyway, 
if you are not using ATP in that sense, you're not producing the heat and the patient's warm-bloodedness, you know, the thing that makes us a mammal versus a reptilian is lost. Um, so we have to maintain body heat. I'm, I recall a patient I had one time with a heart rate of 30, very high blood glucose, um, known diabetic, known renal failure, uh, had a... Uh, was supposed to be doing dialysis and things like that. Found her with a blood pressure um, very low. It was like 60 over something, I don't remember. Heart rate was like 30. Uh, we paced the patient, took her to the ER, got blood pressure back up. We definitely still had some neural function, but she was not alert by any stretch of the imagination. The ER decided to maintain a chemical sedation, therapeutic coma, and... Um, I followed up with her the next day in the ICU to see what was going on. And turns out um, the ICU nurse, or no, it wasn't even the next day, it was later that night. And the ICU nurse was like, yeah, so uh, when we received her from the ER, she had a core temp of 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm like, what the crap? She'd been in shock due to the cardiogenic shock, bradycardia, lack of perfusion. And um, yes, we improved it and the ER had maintained the rate and improved blood pressure through um, the pacing, you know, transcutaneous pacing and things like that and vasopressors, but they had not covered her up. They had not put her on a blanket warmer, um, you know, one of the bear hugger blankets or something. And her core temp had continued to drop. So she had a core temp of 85 when they found her. So uh, kind of crazy. And uh, so it's something to keep in mind. It happens without us really paying attention to it. In EMS, we often avoid uh, checking body temperatures because we think it's not necessarily something we're going to be able to fix. You know, if they're feverish, we're not going to give them Tylenol. Um, but it is it does play an important role and it is something we need to think about much more specifically when we have critical care patients all right so let's talk a little bit about cardiogenic shock this can be caused by a number of different things but your big ones are a heart failure um something that's creating a weak contraction of the heart b tachycardic arrhythmias where the heart is beating so fast that it doesn't have time to refill your uh, ventricles and therefore you have poor cardiac output, or C, bradycardic arrhythmias, where the heart rate is so slow that regardless of the fact that they're filling, you just don't have enough heart rate to maintain cardiac, uh, adequate cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is uh, stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Your stroke volume can be great, but if your heart rate is too low, you're just not gonna get there. All right. So, well, there you go. Poor contractility. Um, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So it's literally what I just said. All right. So, yes, these individuals are going to be at a greater risk of it. Notice that a patient with diabetes mellitus is going to be at increased risk because of the hardening of the arteries, the decrease in neural sensation, and the decrease in tissue perfusion in the heart. Microvasculatures on diabetic patients often have very poor blood flow, and so they can have the common infections in their extremities. Um, notice it says an ejection fraction less than 35%. It is important to note that the average adult ejection fraction is about 55%. Now, your athletes and all that, they're going to have a much, much higher ejection fraction. But for the average American, your ejection fraction is 55%, meaning only 55% of the blood that fills the ventricle actually leaves the ventricle with each contraction. So, doesn't seem like a lot of blood. Well, when you get down to an EF of 35%, that's significantly low. That's almost half of what their base would be. So that, that's a significant loss. And that's uh, MIs can cause that. Uh, congestive heart failure can be the result of that, or, um, even though that's more of a diagnosis. But basically, anything that causes a decrease in ejection fraction, a weakening of the heart muscle and the thickening of the muscle wall, like with cardiomegaly or something along those lines. 
but heart heart attacks, acute myocardial infarction are one of the more common ones that we're going to expect to see. So what do we do if we suspect cardiogenic shock? Well, we're looking at the patient, we're, sus we're doing a full assessment, ABCs, and then we look at the history. Well, there's no indication of trauma. There's no indication of bleeding. There's no indication of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or anything like that. So we're not, or recent exertion and sweating. So we're not thinking hypovolemic because we have no indication on, in their history that they've been losing fluid volumes. Dehydration can play a role in just straight up not drinking fluids. This is very common in extended care facilities, long-term care facilities and stuff, especially with fall risk patients and memory care patients because lazy human beings, <clears throat> who are being paid to work as uh, staff at these facilities, and it's not all of them, it, it, it's specifically lazy ones, will decide that if the patient drinks water, then they will have to go to the bathroom. If the patient has to go to the bathroom, they will have to get up and get them out of bed and help them go to the bathroom. So if we don't give them water, they won't need to go to the bathroom and we won't have to get them out of bed. And so they will withhold water or limit their fluid intakes outside of the direction of the the patient's orders in order to reduce the number of times they have to go to the bathroom. Not a healthy combination. So, um, <clears throat> that is another option for hypovolemic uh, shock, but uh, right now we're looking at cardiogenic. So, when you suspect cardiogenic shock, you're going to, I, you're, you've ruled out the presence of hypovolemia, you're going to have to rule out the presence of sepsis. This is going to indicate that there was no recent, or not, I said sepsis, distributive shock. So there's no indication of recent spinal trauma resulting in neurogenic shock. There's no in, re, indication of infection resulting in sepsis shock. And there's no indication of anaphylaxis, an allergic reaction. You don't have any of the co-commitment co, uh, symptoms from that. So you're kind of literally like, okay, it's probably cardiogenic shock. Well, have they had a history of heart failure? Are they having an MI or recently had an MI? Are they having a bradyarrhythmia or a tachyarrhythmia? You can do this by running your 12 lead. Look for your Q waves. Remember, your Q wave needs to be one millimeter wide and one third the depth. Its, it's depth needs to be one third of the height of the R wave. So that pathologic Q wave, two or more um, contiguous leads will indicate that that was the uh, previous MI, and that can indicate cardiogenic shock. I think I've told you guys about the one I had, the patient I had one time who uh, it was like nine o'clock in the morning and he was complaining of feeling weak and tired and dizzy. And we got there and his blood pressure was like 80, 85 or something like that sitting down. It dropped significantly when we stood up, very orthostatic. So we're like, oh, this is not cool. So what was going on? Well, I had some chest heartburn last night. Oh, tell me about this heartburn. Yeah, it started around, oh, about six o'clock. And um, I tried to go to bed around nine and it was still hurting a lot, but it really didn't quit hurting until about 12 or one in the morning. But I just figured it was heartburn, took some Tums. I'm like, oh, okay, ran the 12 lead, nice, obvious Q waves. You ever had a heart attack before? Nope, never had heart problems. Well, guess what? You had one last night. That was not heartburn. That was a heart attack. The pain lasts six to seven hours. Six to nine hours is typical um, for cardiac uh, events like that. And now a large portion of your heart appears to be dead, according to the electrical act electrical flow. The Q waves indicates that. I said, that's why you're have, feeling dizzy and weak. Your heart is no longer functioning properly. You are in a form of heart failure. So took him to the hospital, tried to get him some help. Now, so the 12 lead kind of runs, points you in that direction. Of course, tachy and bradyarrhythmias can also indicate that. You're going to have a lot of other symptoms that will uh, follow that up though. Now, and um, crystalloids for a heart uh, cardiogenic shock. You can use them, but they are to be limited. Uh, cardiogenic shock does not respond well to crystalloids. If the pump is not functioning, adding more fluid to the system is only going to complicate it more. It'll prevent the blood or it will cause blood to back up. You might have a momentary improvement, but you're in the long term, you're going to have a decrease in blood pressure. So, when suspecting cardiogenic shock, fluid boluses should be like 100, 150 milliliters. Very, very, very small fluid boluses in comparison. Um, and you must keep a very close eye on your patient's lung sounds. So 
When do we use medications to treat cardiogenic shock? It is possible. Um, low dose uh, dopamine, low dose epidrips, these can happen. Uh, these can be helpful. But it's a really great idea to think about the map. If they have a map of 70, that's adequate. That unless you have a reason to believe they have increased intracranial pressure, that they're having some kind of hemorrhage in their brain, a map of 70, even 65, should be sufficient. So when they start getting into a map of 60, now you're talking about a problem, and that's when you're going to want to try to improve that. The problem with giving pressors is while they do improve, improve cardiac output, they also improve, increase the strain on the heart. So we really want to gauge that based on how can we do the most good with the least amount of damage or side effects. So that's the, the goal we're go looking at there. All right, so obstructive shock, like I said, it gets often included into the cardiogenic, whether this is tamponade or uh, pneumo or PEs. So I mentioned tension pneumos earlier, not really a lot more to talk. We will get into tension pneumos a lot more in trauma. I know we talked a little about it back in respiratory, but we will get more into it in trauma. Simple, easy to treat. Once you've recognized that you have a tension pneumo, treatment it, uh, focuses on needle decompression and relieving that pressure. That might have to be done repeatedly during transport if the pneumo returns, but it is a very rapid improvement overall for the patient. So that's the goal there. All right, tamponade. Kind of hard for us to do this in the field, although it is paramedic scope of practice in some areas. It is not here in Georgia. This is not a course to teach you how to do pericardial, or I said tamponade, pericardial synthesis. We are not doing that. Um, but there are parts of the country and such where that does fall into the skills. Now, for the most part, the pericardial synthesis is really beneficial for medical origins. So pericarditis that presents a large pericardial effusion, a large fluid sac buildup around the heart, and then being able to relieve that with the syringe through pericardial synthesis. If it's trauma related, relieving it might help momentarily, but it's really you're you're not causing the you're not fixing the problem because it's probably it's likely going to return very very soon so but i talked a little bit more about that earlier so muscle fold heart tones um that's you're gonna have bulging neck veins you know distended jugular veins and your systolic and diastolic pressures will converge they will get closer and closer together because your heart is well due to the compression on it you're going to have decreased cardiac output and soon they're going to be the same all right. So our next major category is shock, distributive shock. I've mentioned all four of those a minute ago. Or, well, no, I mentioned three of those. I forgot to mention psychogenic shock. Psychogenic shock or psychogenic syncope is a very temporary thing. It was it has been popularized amongst um, classic movies and such that, oh, I saw the mouse. <laughs> Well, yes, that is essentially psychogenic shock. It is something that causes a psychological disruption in your brain, and your brain kind of says, what the, and forgets to cause vasoconstriction throughout the body. And all of your vessels dilate instantaneously, kind of like if you've been binging Netflix for the last six hours and you hadn't done any of the chill part, and all of a sudden you jump up, and um, all that blood is pooled down in your legs and all that and you start getting whoa, a little blacking out here. Well, that's the same concept, except for psychogenic shock. It happens instantaneously. You're already standing or whatever. You just boom, pass out. So because of vasodilation. So septic shock, infections. So not all infections cause septic shock, but all septic shock is the result of some form of infection. In general, I would say our most common origin of this is going to be UTIs, especially in bedridden and elderly patients or people who are using indwelling catheters or have a history of incontinence and have to use um, briefs um, because these briefs are going to prevent them from knowing that they're having irritation with urinating. It also increases their risk of urination. They also have a reduced sensation of that urge, that frequency. So that's a common symptom that people look for. Increased frequency with urination, increased um, 
pain or irritation with urination. Well, when they're using a catheter or when they're using a um, uh, incontinence due to or using briefs due to incontinence, they're not going to have that sensation or recognition. And so it tends to develop, the UTI tends to develop quite significantly before being recognized. It actually will result in altered mental status. Um, in the elderly home care patients, the altered mental status complaint is all, is predominantly going to be related to UTI. Like, um, obviously strokes are more concerning, but frankly, UTIs are more common. Uh, for these patients. So, notice it talks about usually gram negative. Gram negatives can be a little more complicated to treat, and so most antibiotics are looking for gram positives, and you're not going, I mean, obviously there are gram negative antibiotics, but a lot of your frontline treatments are either broad spectrum or, I said frontline, first line. A lot of your first line treatments are either broad spectrum or po gram positive specifics, and it's not until you've gotten cultures done that you get gram negative. You find out it's a gram negative infection. That's assuming that you can get a culture, hence they do blood cultures and all that kind of stuff. But this happens before we get there. This is happening because that hasn't been recognized yet. So what is going on here? Well the inflammatory response system. We know that inflammation is going to be indicated by vasodilation, redness in the tissue, swelling in the area of infection, uh, heat because of, or warmth because of increased blood flow. And this is all, um, and then the pain because of the tissue, uh, the, the stretching of the tissue. This is all due to an increase of blood flow in the area and a release of um, chemical mediators that are uh, dilating the vessels um, like histamines would, uh, leukotrienes and things like that, and then also um, attracting the white blood cells and um, so on and so forth. So this is generally what we would expect to see a localized inflammatory process. Sepsis is when this localized process has entered the bloodstream and has now gone systemic. And so instead of just your foot swelling because of a infection in it, now your entire body is swelling. And so all your blood vessels have enlarged, it causing vasodilation. And when they enlarge, they cause increased capillary leakage and vascular leakage. So fluid is shifting out of the vasculature into the third space, reducing your fluid volume. This is a major problem because not only is just one area dilated, but the entire area is dilated, causing an increased container size, and you're leaking fluid, causing hypovolemia. This ultimately leads to hypoperfusion and needs to be treated very aggressively. Um, there's a lot of suggestions now and indications, and I, it's taking its time finding it to the front lines of EMS, but I think we will see it pushed more and more. It is very big push in the hospitals. Sepsis needs to be identified early and fluid resuscitation should be aggressive. Um, so I already mentioned all this crap. So moving forward, um, there you go. One of the big indications of a distributive shock patient, no matter what it is, is the skin is going to be warm and dry. Anaphylaxis, neuro, and septic, warm and dry. In hypovolemic and in cardiogenic, a common response to the body is vasoconstriction, which causes a pale, cool, clammy skin. Well, because distributive shock is an increased capillary size and increased vasculature size, well, then you're going to have flush skin and it's going to be warm and dry because of the increased blood flow to it. So that's something to look for. You're not going to see that pale, cool, clammy skin that we're used to seeing with hypovolemic and trauma-related shock. Just like with cardiogenic shock, distributive shock is not something to play with. I had a patient one time who was stage four cancer and had all of the symptoms of septic shock as a result of infections acquired through treatment. He was in no good, he was in really bad shape and ended it up, but he was talking to us. Like he's laying in bed, fully alert and oriented, talking to us, communicating, explaining us what's going on. We're trying, you know, but his heart rate's up, his blood pressure's low, he's got warm, cool, or warm, flush skin throughout his body, warm, dry skin. He looked like sepsis, you know, we were treating as such. He ended up coding within 10 minutes of getting to the hospital because his condition was that uh, 
far gone, regardless of the treatments and interventions we did. These patients can crash very quickly. So do not waste time on scene with your interve interventions on distributive and cardiogenic shock. Get on the road. Whether you're trying to start IVs or do tr transcutaneous pacings or whatever it happens to be, do not waste time on scene. Do your stuff in route for the adult patient. It is different for peds, but this isn't the part of the class where we're trying to talk about peds. So, normal temp intensive patient's dopamine. Wait, we're giving dopamine to a patient with a normal blood pressure? Yeah, this is one of the unique circumstances in which we will do that. Normal intensive patients the, the dopamine will improve their problem. They may be maintaining pressure, but that doesn't mean that pressure is adequate or in the big scheme of things, what they need. So yes, a normal tensive patient will receive a um, dopamine infusion. Um, norepinephrine for warm shock, this is when before their blood pressure is drop or their uh, body temp has started to drop epi when it's starting to get cold uh this is the patient who doesn't have the fever anymore uh nor epi they may still have the fever a uh a febrile um sepsis is a common phenomena where they no longer have the ability to produce a fever due to the shock and so um epi that's a much more aggressive state and so we'll use epi as a vasoconstrictor um and radial bolt or excuse me Fluid boluses are a must. We are talking start fluids immediately, flow those fluids in there, get that um, on board. These patients are going to need large quantities of fluid. There's a lot of conversation as to, are we talking about doing a um, lactated ringers? Are we wanting to do saline? What are we gonna use? There's a lot of uh, opinion on that. Use what your protocol says, use what you have available to you at that time. Um, and then, like I said before, maintain body heat as much as you can. All right, so neurogenic shock. Um, spinal cord injuries, I'm not gonna talk heavy about this right now because we're gonna focus on neurogenics a lot more in trauma, but it's a loss of sympathetic nervous system tone as a result of a spinal cord injury. Similar to a sepsis patient, all of their vessels are dilating and you have an increased container size, but this is not caused by infection. This is caused by a lack of epi in their body. And so you're also going to see their general neuroparalysis in addition to the signs and symptoms of shock. So gen you're gonna treat them for their trauma, you're gonna give them fluids to maintain radial pulses, and um, yes, you might end up using vasopressors and things like that as well. Um, anaphylaxis, again, this is not our uh, allergy reactions chapter, environmental emergencies chapter, so not gonna get into it heavily, but I kind of touched on it already. Histamine is released during an allergic reaction. If you've ever been stung on your arm or something like that and you're not anaphylactic to it, you'll notice that your tissue starts to swell and itch right in that area. That's because histamine has been released to dilate the local capillaries, causing that pain and tightness. That's why we put ice packs on it to cool it and constrict it. And that's to improve the movement of antibodies into that area, white blood cells, in order to remove that toxin. Well, in anaphylaxis, this localized swelling and histamine released has become systemic and all of your vessels are dilating and leaking in the same way. It's similar to the way sepsis progresses, except it progresses much faster than sepsis. And is to, instead of using slow mediators of the inflammatory process, it is using the rapid mediators of the immune reaction or immune response. IgE antibodies are very commonly used there. Uh, but again, this is not our class on anaphylaxis, so I'm not uh, going to break it down as much. If you want to pause and read through this, that would be great. But that really kind of shows all the different issues related to distributive shock, and specifically with anaphylactic shock. All right, this is another common cause of anaphylaxis. We don't see this in all anaphylactic patients, but we can. This is. Uh, um, angioedema, 
swelling in the tongue and the mouth. Um, this person is not sticking their tongue out. That tongue has swollen to the point that it is sticking out on its own. Um, this is a third spacing of fluid outside of the vasculature. Hence, we need to be treating with fluids. We know that we treat um, anaphylactic shock with epinephrine IM, or we can use epi uh, IV if we need to, uh, but it's a different dose and different concentration. Um, but we're also going to want to provide fluids. The patient is losing fluids in that third spacing, so we will work together with that. All right, I mentioned psychogenic shock earlier. Um, Life-threatening cause include, so in these cases, that's, bored, that's really getting away from the realm of psychogenic shock. If you have a regular heartbeat, if you're seeing uh, a brain aneurysm, that would literally be a hemorrhagic stroke. Now we're not really thinking psychogenic shock. Yes, theoretically, because the brain's not working right, but we're going to be treating the AFib, the irregular heartbeat, or we're going to be treating the hemorrhagic shock or, or the hemorrhagic phoragic stroke. I mean, something along those lines. We're not treating them as, oh, I saw the mouse or whatever it happened to be. But um, yeah, so most of the time psychogenic shock uh, relieves on its own. Once the patient goes horizontal, their brain kicks back in, things start working, they sit up, they feel better and problem solved. Doesn't re normally require a large amount of intervention, but never underestimate the possibility of another factor causing this. Is do not write it off as psychosyncope until you have seen uh, their 12 lead and done a complete assessment and ruled out all possibilities of some form of cardiac arrhythmia. It is possible for people to run a tr uh, have a runner like VTAC that is got poor cardiac output. They pass out due to low blood pressure and then their ca heart kicks back into a normal rhythm. So that by the time we are there, their heart looks fine, but they were having these runs of VTAC that caused their syncope. So. All right, hypovolemic shock is the next one. Let me see what we've, uh, let's hold on just a second. All right, so hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemic shock is going to occur anytime that your patient, you know, obviously you have not enough blood volume. We've mentioned hemophoragic versus non-hemophoragic already. So what are we gonna see? Di uh, dehydrated patients will have poor skin turgor, uh, shrunken eyes, tongue, uh, that kind of stuff. But um, other symptoms of dehydration, syncopal episode or fainting or getting close to fainting, back, blacking out that orthostatic uh, symptoms and such like that when they stand up. Fortunately, well, for one thing, hypovolemic shock is actually really easy to treat. You simply restore blood volume. When the hypovolemic shock is the result of a loss of fluids or decreased in uh, absorption of fluids, well, it's even easier to treat because it's just saline. You're not trying to stop bleeding or anything like that and such. So saline's a good way to start. Uh, it is imperative that we monitor lung sounds to make sure that we're not f uh, giving the fluids too quickly, but um, yeah. This should all go without uh, saying, I believe. Um, there's nothing new or unique here. Um, I do prefer to monitor my uh, fluids and blood pressure based on their mental status. I think their mental status is a great way to know if you have adequate pressure. Yeah, great, 110 BP, systolic 120, 90, whatever. That's Those are all great numbers, but what we really care about is, is their brain working? Do they have adequate mental function with that? So what does this mean? Respiratory insufficiency is when you're not allowed or, or excuse me not able to inhale enough oxygen or the adequate amount of oxygen and you may have enough blood you may have enough heart uh function you may have enough blood pressure and all that kind of stuff but if you're not getting enough air into your lungs it forms a form of hypoxic um what i think it's called hypoxic hypoxia or something like that where there's the hypoxia to the tissue is caused by a lack of oxygen in the lungs. Um, 
So this could be caused by an inability to absorb the oxygen, but it could also be caused by an excess of, um, uh, some other chemical or medication that's preventing the absorption of the oxygen, um, like CO on your, um, in the air, having a greater affinity to the hemoglobin binding to the hemoglobin or like cyanide in the cells preventing the cells from being able to uh, function or absorb or metabolize the oxygen i should say could also be this anemia abnormally low quantities of hemoglobin and or low blood cells um so you have enough blood volume, but you don't have enough blood product. So you don't have enough RBCs or something like that in the system. So how do we handle this? Well, um, obviously we make certain that the patient's got a good airway. Uh, we want to make certain that the oxygen is staying in and running through the circuit. So if there's a problem with their lungs, if you are leaking in the airway, you know, you have a ruptured trachea or bad seal on your airway, or you have a pneumothorax or something along those lines, you're going to want to make sure those are taken care of. And, um, and then also you're going to want to monitor in tidal co2s and spo2s spo2s can be really handy for mo determining whether or not the patient is getting good oxygen saturations to the fingertip but if there's a problem with um cyanide or co or something along those lines it's not going to tell you that they're getting adequate oxygenation in the cells it's just yeah the blood's carrying the oxygen or if you have a decreased number of hemoglobin or decreased number of red blood cells your spo2 might look great but it doesn't mean that you're getting it so monitor your end tidal co2s to find out if the patient's becoming acidotics in some way in which case higher volumes of oxygen may help with that by increasing your partial pressure of o2 in the arterial in the arterial blood also known as the PaO2. So uh, these are critical patients. Do not waste time on scene. 10 minutes is actually very limited amount of time on scene. It's just pretty much get them out of the house, get them in the ambulance, get on the road. Uh, do not delay transport trying to attempt a um, uh, IV or things like that. This is straight up, get on the road, do your IVs and route. Uh, one thing you might want to consider if you're dealing with cardiogenic shock is it could be worth getting your 12 lead before transportation. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry. So do consider at minimum getting a 12 lead before transportation. It doesn't take a long time to do that. Otherwise, get on the road and do the rest on, on the way. All right. So that pretty much wraps up up chapter 40 uh please email me and let me know if you have any questions or concerns related to that otherwise i'll see you next time